Hello and welcome to Perspectives. I'm Leanne Peck. Now, remember the dot-com boom over a decade ago, just when startups were sprouting up all over Asia? The US dot-com bubble burst, putting an end to that momentum. Well, it seems the startup culture is taking off again in Asia as economies here continue to rack up decent growth relative to the rest of the world. Healthy economies, a growing middle class and favorable business environment is turning Asia into the place to be not just for the big multinational but also the startups. Korea was a standout with startups doubling in the past four years, while some of this year's biggest tech deals have come out of China. Search engine Baidu just bought the app firm 91 Wireless for a whopping 1.9 billion US dollars. So, what must budding entrepreneurs get right to secure the backing of big venture capitalists to turn their cool ideas into multi-million dollar success stories? Joining me to discuss this are four leaders in their fields. Kylie Ung, Southeast Asian venture partner of US Accelerator and Seed Fund 500 Startups, which invests in and mentors startups. He's also the founder of the social news website, says.com. Darius Chung, co-founder of a new roommate search service called Homey.co. His previous startup, 10Cube, a mobile security service, was acquired by U.S. security technology company McAfee in 2010. Jeffrey Payne, he is the founding a partner of Golden Gate Ventures, a 10 million U.S. dollar early stage fund and incubator based in Singapore that helps mentor and fund startups to the tune of half a million dollars. And Reza Benham, founder and CEO of the data-driven media buying company at Central in Singapore. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Let's start with you, you uh, Jeffrey. A dozen years or so after the dot-com um, bust, startups seem to be alive and well again in Asia. And you spent the early part of your career as you know, so early stage venture in private equity in the US, and now you're back here looking for gems to fund, to incubate. Tell us why. Um, basically, a few years ago, um, um, the region of Southeast Asia has reminded me of how China was back in the early 2000s. So it is actually pretty exciting, although Southeast Asia is not, you know, uh, you, you cannot label it as a country or a uh, re uh, homogeneous region. It is actually pretty hard to scale out in these uh, in this, uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries. Mm -hmm. But um, it's showing a lot of signs that it, the growth is coming. Yeah. So after Silicon Valley, surely, I mean, China is the largest uh, venture capital uh, market in the world, followed by India. But as you said, I mean, Asia is a, is a big place. I mean, are you seeing, uh, Reza, uh, this sort of upswing right across the region? I think the growth is right across the region, probably at different rates. Um, obviously, China and India, uh, they have a lot of scale. And that's why you see a lot of uh, money floating in, in, into, in, into those countries from outside, but as well um, in terms of VCs investing in startups. And then you have countries like Korea, which are very advanced in terms of mobile and mobile apps and so forth. So you, you have this dynamic of emerging versus mm -hmm. sort of developed countries. Yeah. And that holds also in the tech world. Yeah. So you've moved sort of yeah. from the developed world to, you know, more developing you know, sort of in Asia. You worked many years in, in Yahoo in, the, in Silicon Valley. You came over to Asia as managing director of Yahoo Southeast Asia. And now you've gone sort of start up, you know, with that central. Sure. Um, what is the potential here? I mean, obviously, you're seeing huge positives to be here, right? Well, yes. I mean, uh, Singapore in particular is such a hub and there's a lot of uh, headquarters of major firms based here. So uh, Singapore is a good place to be if you want to be able to scale across Asia Pac. Um, you still need to get out there. It's a good hub, but it doesn't mean that you can do everything from here. And uh, so that's, that's why I'm here. Okay. Now, Kylie, let's bring you into the conversation because you're now a venture partner for 500 startups in the U.S. You've got 10 million U.S. dollars to spend in Southeast Asia, right? Um, which countries look interesting to you? Well, uh, the specific region I'm looking at is Southeast Asia. And I, I think a lot of this conversation where we talk about Asia, we see a difference between China, India, and Korea, which is a whole different conversation over Southeast Asia. I think, Jeffrey, you were mentioning Southeast Asia as well, more referring to this space as what you're coming back to as a specific part of uh, Asia. Mm -hmm. So for me, like what brings, what I'm looking at Southeast Asia and I'm looking at all the countries within Southeast Asia, um, specifically markets like Indonesia, uh, Thailand, Philippines, uh, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, all of that collectively 
it's it's crazy exciting. I think mm-hmm. the, the growth we're talking about a, a even more exciting growth story in Asia. This is this corner is where things are getting really mm-hmm. heating up. Yeah, Darius. Now you're proof too that startups are, are back mm-hmm. in Asia, and we know, of course, uh, in, in 2010 that the U.S. tech security firm McAfee reportedly paid 10 million bucks for your first startup, uh, Ten Cube, which famously uh, created that mobile phone. Um, software that allows people to lock their phones if they lose them. So um, did you ever think that you could be based in Asia and then go global from here? Oh, in hindsight, it would uh, seem to be a very daunting task. But because when we first started right out of college, we didn't know better and we didn't think whether it was possible. And uh, we seem to be able to do it. And I think um, now, if, you, if I look back, I think it's entirely possible. In fact, I would say it's probable that this is going to happen. Um, just like Israel has done it, just like places like Estonia has produced many good startups, I think we can too. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what are the hot uh, sort of startup themes right now? We know that, you know, sort of uh, Groupon clones were all the rage in the last <laughs> two years. And, and Kylie, you had a, had a clone of sorts in Malaysia um, called Groups More, which you subsequently then also sold to Groupon when it came to your <laughs> neck of the woods. Um, besides that sort of thing and social networking sites, etc., what are the hot themes right now? Um, I would say data is is one hot theme across all of the subsectors within tech. Um, big data, we, we hear about big data all the time, and it's about how you leverage data and how you make it actionable. Well, yeah. I, I think in terms of like yeah. hot trends that you yeah. hear a lot about what you just mentioned, then um, from my perspective, uh, I try to stay away from the hot trends. I think Southeast Asia is full of low-hanging fruit problems, everyday problems which aren't hot, aren't sexy to talk about, but that's where you can solve real-world problems and make real-world money and that's what I'd be putting, betting my money on. <laughs> so. mm-hmm. Okay, would you agree? Because you're a VC too. I mean, are um, you going yeah. for the low-hanging fruit or are you going for the sexy stuff? Yeah, I think uh, as, as, uh, as the fund, we, we, we tend to lean a little bit more to the consumer-facing companies. Uh, but I think this year, uh, uh, business-facing or enterprise software is coming back. Um, healthcare and education is always going to be there. And that's going to be quite interesting, especially in this region. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Once in a while, you'll see you know, very crazy things that come, come out from Southeast Asia that could be global from day one. Uh-huh. Uh, but typically, we don't see that very often. Okay. All right. Darius, I mean, wh- what, what, what's your take on this? I mean, you're starting a new venture right now. Well, I mean, um, from an investor point of view, I think one of the trends um, that is almost cliche to, to talk about is e-commerce. Uh, I think there's a lot of one-on-one stuff that is still being done here, buying groceries online, buying pet food online, buying... Um, cosmetics online still still needs to be done. It's not done yet. Um, but I'm like Jeffrey. I think I'm I'm very interested to see where we see the black swans, the the ones that really go global, become billion dollar company. Mm, those so, those are very interesting. Yeah. Too. So you're still looking for the big killer apps. <laughs> yeah. Now most of you have had some form of exposure to the startup culture in Silicon Valley. So. What would you say is the difference between, you know, the startup culture there and uh, here in Asia, Jeffrey? If you do spend time in the, in the Bay Area and, and compare, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the ability for the people to um, share what they're doing and be able to help you out even though they don't know you. You, know, you, you, could, you could be pitching um, your idea um, the first 10 minutes when you meet someone new and you know, immediately they'll, they'll try to help you out and try to inter- introduce people that might help you out. Um, that's typically been the valley culture that I've, I've been involved with for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing is a lot of people there do like to do things. They like to build things. Um, and most of the time they just build it. They don't really ask questions. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, so that's, it's a very building hacker kind of build, builder type of culture. Uh-huh. Um, so that's that's a little bit different. So are you saying that the, there isn't a building culture here in Asia then? I, I think there's not so much of the tinkering nature here. Yeah. There's building, but building typically requires people to buy into a plan, to be convinced about it, and to have it all mapped out to say, okay, this is what we're going to build. Um, in Silicon Valley, it's a lot more experimental. It's a lot more easygoing. It's like, oh, I have a great idea today. Mm-hmm. Tonight, I'm going to build it. Okay. Right? So it's just you don't ask too many questions. You just go build it. All right. So I think that's lacking. Okay, what about this entrepreneurial spirit? Because we, we hear a lot about how, you know, people in the Valley are very entrepreneurial, people in Asia are very risk-averse. Mm-hmm. True or false? Reza? Um, I think that probably holds true for, 
I guess, the older generation. I think the young generation is very entrepreneurial, and they've probably seen a lot of success of the Mike Zuckerbergs and people um, all over Silicon Valley who've even left college to pursue the, their entrepreneurial dream. I think the one sort of big difference that I see between here and Silicon Valley is that uh, success breeds success. So in Su Silicon Valley, you have a lot of serial entrepreneurs um, who will help the new entrepreneur. And here, you know, we're very early stages. Most of our entrepreneurs are not serial entrepreneurs. They're first-time entrepreneurs. And therefore, just like Darius was mentioning, they don't know what they don't know until they get into it. And uh, so they're very risk-taking. Uh, but at the same time, you need that, that as well as you need some guidance from people uh -huh. who've done it before. Right. Uh, what do you think? I mean, there are no success stories or not as many success stories here in Asia. So uh, you need even bigger risk takers here. Yeah, you know, uh, to the point of, uh, to the point of uh, uh, Asia not being so risk taking and, and not being that entrepreneurial. When I look at uh, uh, my parents' generation and, and even older, you see entrepreneurs everywhere, except that it's not in the context of tech entrepreneurs. You know, they're opening shops. You know, I was in, I was in the Philippines. I, I was in a bus and somebody was trying to sell me a feather duster on the road. You know, that's an entrepreneur right there. That's a risk taker. He's risking his life every day to sell me a feather duster. So, but the difference is, is that uh, the infrastructure for technology is super mature in some developed markets. And, and right now, this is the point where it's being more mature. Mm -hmm. So I'll see a lot of that entrepreneurial spirit actually flowing into technology because now it's way more possible. And as a true story in Indonesia, I'm actually looking at a startup who was a former street vendor. He picked up programming. And he and his wife, instead of selling stuff on the street, they're actually building something to help people sell things online. So. Very good. So who says we have no risk takers in Asia? We're going to take a short break now. When we come back, we're going to look at the nuts and bolts of starting up. So don't go away. Welcome back to Perspectives. Now, let's talk about the ABCs of starting up. Now, looking in from the outside, it all looks really simple, right? You've got this hot idea, some VC comes running with lots of money, and then the next thing you know, you're in your 20s and you're a billionaire like Zuckerberg. It's happened, but does it happen every day? Darius. Well, I think it definitely happens. It happens um, less often here than elsewhere. Um, but I think it definitely can happen and will happen here. Did you, did you say billion? I've never seen billion in this region yet. Oh, that's, there are billionaires. The guys who found the creative is a billionaire. Yeah, yeah, no, they're yeah, absolutely right. But I mean, right. this perception that it's so easy to rake in the millions, right, or that billion. I mean, do people underestimate how difficult it is to start up? Well, I think people, well, I, what I, what I kind of have a pet peeve about is like people kind of glorifying how hard it is. Oh, I'm a startup founder. I, I ate right, I ate sand for three months and, and now I'm successful. You know what I mean? There's a certain script that uh, uh, sometimes media and sometimes our founders themselves kind of run themselves through and that couldn't be further away from the truth. Sometimes you don't have a hot idea. Sometimes you're back against, against the wall and, and you just decide to do something not because it's a hot idea, because it's a simple idea. And it turns out to be a great idea that replicates itself. And there are hardships and some people have it easier. All of these things exist. And having kind of built and sold two companies of my own, and uh, I've, I've kind of seen two different sides happen to me. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. What, what do you think? Because you left your, your corporate job at Yahoo and then you've struck out on your own, right? So has it really been as, as easy as Darius is making it out to be that, you know, the yeah. hardships are overblown? Um, I actually like to disagree with that. I, I, I think it's, you know, as they say, it's 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. And especially in a market uh, like Southeast Asia, uh, I guess... We were sort of one of the early batches of, of startup tech startups uh, over the last four or five years, and um, so it, the ecosystem's not there. So you have to oftentimes build everything from scratch. So if you're doing something that is, for example, an employee stock option program, you want to reward your employees. There are no, there are very few specialists in the market who know how to set that up. So you have to really go from scratch and sort of almost teach your attorney. Mm -hmm. So right. let's rewind, right? You have a hot idea. Um, it might not make you a billionaire in your 20s, but it could uh, you know, be a pretty decent hit. So how do you go about converting that idea into something which is going to be worthwhile? Jeffrey. Um, so I, I, I run a you know, sort of like a four months mentoring program called Found Institute here in Singapore. So I run into this all the time for the last three years. Um, so I can tell you 
the first step is the founder needs to really love what he's doing or the industry that he's in um, or else it's very, very hard to keep going uh, because it is hard. Right? No matter what anyone tells you, um, starting a company from scratch when you're a nobody, it's extremely, extremely hard. Um, the second thing is usually, to me, the good ideas tend to come from um, side projects that they do because someone has a need or um, you, know, you, you ask yourself, what, what are you wasting time on? And then you try to build something to, to feed that passion. Um, so usually things that stick to you tends to come from what you love to do mm -hmm. um, and what you just waste your time on. And that's typically what you should ask, you know, a lot of founders should ask themselves a, a uh -huh. little bit more. Okay. So, so do you agree that you should be asking those questions, what do people need, what do I need? And then you just, you just build on that idea and you keep iterating it until you get some sort of traction by way of users and then you pitch it to investors. I absolutely agree that the best thing to do is just start working on it. Um, if you don't know how to work on it yourself, maybe bits and pieces, you don't know how to do it, programming, whatever it is, go find somebody to work with and start building it. We hear a lot as well uh, about first mover advantage, right? I mean, how important is it to move first? Because we know if you look at, at Google and Facebook and Dropbox or whatever, I mean, they weren't first movers and they've totally made it, right? So um, is there a hard and fast rule here? I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. I think it depends on uh, the dynamics. Sometimes being a fast follower is actually better than being a first yeah. mover because you learn from the first person's mistake or the first company's mistake. You know, Google was a great example of that. Facebook, also an example of that. So, um, you know, in these markets, however, we see a lot of um, what I would call sort of copycats of, of, of business models that, uh, that come from the U.S. And the reason for that is that it has been, that, that idea has been de-risked in yes. some way. Either mm -hmm. the business model has been figured out um, or something else has been figured out. And it needs nuance. A lot of times those ideas and executions need nuances for the Asian or Southeast Asian um, environment, but uh, usually those are a bit less risky than mm -hmm. brand new ideas. Yes, so I think that's the challenge for startups here in Asia, right? The fact that uh, the, the risks have already been taken elsewhere, or the big ideas or the obvious ideas have already been taken by mm -hmm. the, the people in the West, and so they've got to go beyond the, the obvious. I mean, Kylie, you uh, sort of created this, this Groupon clone as yeah. such, which you then flogged very, very quickly as well. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you go beyond um, adapting from yeah. a U.S. model and yeah. really innovating and coming yeah. up with something really fresh. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting because for the Groupon clone, we're number 86 to enter the market, you know, and yet in three months, we became number two. So sometimes being a super latecomer, uh, you know, you still can fight different strategies to win. And uh, to what you're asking about innovation for the sys.com company, which I founded, um, when I started doing my research on market expansion, I expected that same play to happen in the rest of the world, but it didn't. So it was actually something very unique to Malaysia. Until today, when we're replicating right now in Indonesia, Philippines, and so on and so forth, the, um, there is a market adaptation risk, which I think, uh, Reza, you hinted at. And that's, that's where the innovation, the, the nuance of innovation really becomes very exciting. Just follow up on what Kylie was saying. You know, for example, in Vietnam, there are players who started an e-commerce company and realized, number one, there's no credit card system. Number two, there's no delivery system or courier system. So they've actually gotten into the courier business and into the payment business by accident. And it turns out that those are the, uh, those are the areas which they've really prospered and now there are other people using them for their logistics infrastructure and their payment infrastructure as opposed to what they originally started out being which was an e-commerce company. It, and it turns out that you know when, when this started Vietnam didn't even have proper um, detailed street maps so there were corners <clears throat> excuse me, and alleys that only bikes bikes were able to go to. So, so this logistics uh, company <laughs> managed to hire bikes and, mm -hmm. uh, and people delivering into these areas where it wasn't even on the map. And, and would you say that's what VCs are looking at right now? I mean, they're much more scrupulous now. It's not about one guy and, you know, this uh, fantastic uh, proposition and Eureka, that's it. They're looking at uh, real traction now. Just having an idea alone sometimes isn't enough, right? Sometimes, you, sometimes uh, it'll impress a, it'll, for obvious reasons, if you've already executed on an idea you have and you've produced a lot of like, customers who love your product, that de-risks the investment for the venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. So yes, mm -hmm. I would agree to some degree. When they talk about traction, right? They talk about a million users and that yep. equals traction. Right now, VCs are looking at 10 million users. Is that true? 
I'd say if you're making a game or a social network or instant messenger, that's probably true. If you're making enterprise software that every user is going to be worth 100 bucks, a million users is a lot. Yeah. So basically, I mean, even the metrics for measuring traction, I mean, that can't be too generalist. I mean, do you find that because VCs are also cottoning on to um, sort of investing and funding startups that they too need to be educated, as it were, in terms of what to look out for um, before putting their money uh, into certain things? Risk investors, as far as the venture capital goes, there are essentially two kinds, I think. Um, I think Kylie and myself um, and, and the angel investors on, on uh, here are more on the first kind where we take uh, a little bit more risk. We share the vision with the founders a little bit more. Um, whereas the other, the other growth investors, they tend to look at numbers a little bit more. They tend to look at your growth. They tend to look at, you know, they tend to scrutinize numbers more than the product or how people use your product. Um, so, so it's like we're, we're betting before the startup is obviously successful. Then mm -hmm. as it gets more and more obvious, then they become later and later stage and then they raise money from perhaps different types of investors who uh, expect a different kind of return profile, but also they, you know, because they're investing with less risk. Mm -hmm. So the valuations of companies, typically when Jeffrey or myself or any early stage investor goes in, we absorb a lot of risk and the valuations of the startup would be a bit lower. Different companies have different metrics yes. and, and so a cloud company is a very different kind of metrics than a consumer facing social network for example as Darius mentioned. All right so there's no one size fits all uh, metrics for judging startups. On that note we're going to go for another commercial break. Do stay tuned. Welcome back to Perspectives. Now, we're talking startups, so let's talk about fundraising, right? Darius, how much money should startups raise and at what juncture? Uh, as little as possible and as late as possible. How do you mean? Well, I, if they don't need to raise any money and they can scrap together whatever they can to build something and make it work, um, I think that's the best. Raising, raising money is often an overhead that most startups do not want to bear. I think there is a culture of like making it all about raising money and they kind of optimize their startup for raising money as though that's the end goal where actually you want to create a real business to serve real customers and make real money. So it's, uh, I, you know, sometimes you, if you think raising money is the end all, you'll do it too early, you do it too soon, do it too much and you're going to waste that money. But as a VC, Jeffrey, is there a general rule of thumb when it comes to startup funding? The entire team has to, be, has to believe that whatever you're building has potential, has um, a future. Um, and that, that only comes in, you know, um, right after you launch and you, have, you see some metrics that you're proud of. And as a founder, you have the face to actually ask for money because mm -hmm. you have the data to back that. So that's the good time to, 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 to raise money. Yeah, but shouldn't there be some sort of general runway? I mean, you, shouldn't you have a yeah. general yeah. runway so, of one and a half yeah. years, two okay. years or something? So for most startups, especially internet startups, a couple of stages. The, the very first stage, angel, angel money, you try to raise this as late as possible because you're trying to find something that already works and trying to scale that, right? And then once you have that, um, uh, you, would ha you go to the, uh, the seed round of money. Um, and I would say you probably want to raise 12 to 18 month runway for that. So you have enough um, track time to prove that you can actually scale that up. Um, so that's kind of the first two stages. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference in the funding culture between um, us in Asia and, and in the US? Is that the, the standard sort of funding route? in Silicon Valley, success has, has bred more success and people are more risk-taking with their money yep. and will fund ideas from, from smart people um, just based on an idea sometimes. And, and they will give them enough rope, if you will, to go to a certain length and, and test that idea yep. out. And the culture is that even if one out of, you know, nine out of ten fail, it's okay. The one out of ten will make, uh, make up for the rest. Um, here, we're a bit more risk-averse in terms of funding, and I guess the government of Singapore, for example, has stepped in um, over the last four or five years and really helped seed companies, and therefore we have a lot of early-stage companies in, in, in this part of the world, in, in Singapore, but we still have, we're missing sort of the one to five million uh, type of investors, the Series A investors. Uh, there are a couple, but uh, there are very few for, for this market. 
I think right now, uh, with the advent of more uh, former founders getting into investor roles, they're bringing with them different expertise that they can de-risk early stage. So slowly, we'll have more and more startups come into the pipeline for more, that, that look really good, have a lot of traction, and these conservative investors will be able to then invest in more of that. So I think uh, that problem will come maybe three years from now, where there's just too much money going to, yeah. <laughs> flowing into startups. Yeah, so that would be a good problem. We have a lot of companies who are now falling off the cliff because they raised uh, seed money in Singapore, this yeah. isn't, and, and, but they can't raise Series A money. Yeah. So, so the issue is that uh, some investors here would like to look at the P&L and see that you, know, you have a path to profitability. But in the U.S., that company, uh, sort of people who invest in Series A don't necessarily look at those metrics. Yep. They look at the idea and the team. Yep. Actually, the team is something we haven't talked about, but that's probably the most important yeah, yeah. Um, aspect of a startup. Are you saying that the, the primary cause of startup failure here in Asia is really them really running out of, of money? Whereas I think generally, um, you know, a lot of the research on startups shows that, you know, a lot of people uh, basically close shop because they quit too early. You know, I, the, it's not a cause of death. It's, <laughs> it's about, and, and most of these startups should die, right? Yeah. And that's, that's, the, that's what the game is. But what is also happening is that those that shouldn't die are not getting the oxygen they need. Yeah, I think classically in Silicon Valley, when we talk about Series A and Series B, what's happening is the Series A and B guys are willing to take more risk, even though when it's not so obvious. Right. They're willing to bet on the team, they're willing to bet on early traction. Whereas over here, uh, they're more classical about it. They say, hey, you've got to prove that you've got like some revenue, at least revenues of X million and whatnot. Right. Then I'll consider a Series A check, so on and so forth. Right. But at the same time, right, what he's saying and what I see a lot of is that, uh, I'm, and not just in Singapore, but uh, different countries as well, you do not qualify for uh, Series A investment. And then they go around complaining that, oh, you know, there's not enough investors out there. So you know, how are you going to change the mindset? Because if everything is so cut and dry. I mean, yeah. how are startups really going to thrive here? So I think it, 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 it's a chicken and the egg. So we have to build both sides of the ecosystem yes, together. Exactly. We have to have many more serial entrepreneurs, people who are experienced, and we have to have some successes happen. Yep. And therefore, you, then you'll see more investors coming. And that's happened actually in China already. In China, it's a different dynamic altogether yeah. than yeah. Singapore because if you have the right team and if you have the right entry into the market in China, oftentimes there's a lot of risk being taken on, on companies um, because the scale is big and people have made a lot of money uh, in China. That, that trend hasn't happened um, as strongly in this part of the world in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Okay, let me come back to, to startups and the business of startups, right? Yeah. And talk about uh, when uh, the right time is to launch. Is there such a thing as a right time to launch? Well, I, I subscribe to what uh, Reid Hoffman says um, of LinkedIn. Um, he basically says, if you're not embarrassed about your launch, you're launching too late. Um, that is given that your product has to do one thing right at least for the users. Uh, and depending on what your startup does, that can be very easy to very hard. If you're building Tesla, your first product is pretty damn hard. Is it more detrimental to launch slowly than to launch quickly? I, I would say my rule of thumb is that it, it depends on whether it's a crowded market or not. If you're a complete new category, Twitter was a great example. Twitter could afford to make a lot of mistakes and therefore in that case, I would argue you have to launch early and iterate fast yeah, yeah. and fail early and often. Yeah. Uh, whereas in a category where there are a lot of competitors and you have to meet a minimum standard just to be able to launch, then you have to get things much in much better order. Mm -hmm. So obviously the competition is also going to help you determine you know, when to go to market or not. There is a kind of a, I think a classical rule. People talk about the MVP, minimum viable product. Right? And the whole idea is to get your product to a point where it's, just good enough for you to launch and not over-engineer and over-perfect it before launching. Um, some founders or some startups um, take this a bit too far and they launch what's called a mediocre value proposition <laughs> as an MVP. And then like customers hit it, especially when they've got pre-expectations from, from competitors. Where to launch is also crucial. Should companies be thinking local or thinking global? It starts with the founder's mindset. The, their mindset needs to know where they want to be based and what kind of uh, users and customers they want to serve. Um, not all, um, you know, I, I could take an example, not all Singaporeans want to start a company in the US. Um, most of them are comfortable starting companies here. And we all know Singapore is small, so there lies the challenge. So, so this is the perennial sort of conundrum, right? Should entrepreneurs be trying to create apps for the first world or should they be trying to solve problems in their own backyards? 
Sure, and, and I think we've had a lot of ex local examples that have uh, that are you know being very successful. Uh, we've had you know Job Street, Jobs TV in this part of the world. We've had Red Mart, which is just focused on Singapore. It's a, it's a new startup, uh, a few years old, and in that case, it doesn't make sense to think global. It actually makes sense to think about your backyard. Yeah. So it dominated. really depends and dominated yeah. exactly. Yeah. So it really depends on your business model and what scale means to each company. Scale yeah. could mean very different things to two to different companies. Yeah. So I mean, and there are a ton of opportunities to exploit, wouldn't you say, in Asia, um, in in this backyard, without having to go anywhere near Silicon Valley and, to start and, with. And that op you tap down to something, you're saying uh, the, the opportunity, that's what actually decides whether you're going to do it uh, local, global, global, local, local. You know what I mean? It's, it's where the opportunity that you can actually attack and you can, you can actually own. So, for example, um, some people might not, uh, some less popular markets, like for example, say Malaysia, right? Um, Malaysia is the home to three of, the three of Southeast Asia's largest tech IPOs. We actually built in Malaysia and then expanded out from it. So we've got Job Street, um, iProperty, and uh, MyEG. So, and, and, and so it doesn't mean that all because it's a, I mean, for, for a lot of founders, they shouldn't be just following a trend, basically. Or saying, oh, that's a hot market. We should launch there. We should do it over there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the not so hot markets can be actually the, the best opportunities out there as well. Mm -hmm. The art of, of what it is, is how do you see going from one place to really scale up and to be able to scale that, whether it's regionally or globally, and for that to be a big business. And, and if, that's and where if the you want is. to take yes. it there as well, right? And right. If, if that's what you want as well. Yeah, so, so if, you do, if you do have a multi-city or a multi-city sort of strategy, as, as it were, then, I mean, launching in the wrong market is also um, a, a pretty bad thing, would you say? Absolutely. I think there's, there's something to be said about launching at the right time, at the right place. Um, you know, an environment, an advanced environment like Silicon Valley is very different than here. If you sort of innovate on the edges and tweak things in, in Silicon Valley, that's, that's probably accepted because everybody's o already at a certain level in terms of being able to understand that space. But you do that here, you're probably too early. Um, so it really depends on the environment. Well, as, as with all things, you need the right time and the right place. Uh, stay with us, we're going for another break. Welcome back to Perspectives. We're talking startups this month, and um, let's talk about that big bad word, failure. Because everybody loves successes, but for every success story, there have probably been hundreds of failures. So if you want to be a startup, you need to have a real stomach for failure, would you say? I think there's a big difference between a company or an attempt, an iteration of a specific company fails in the sense of it didn't work as you expected it to. Yeah, it's like an experiment that didn't... Compared to... I feeling like I failed as a person. I, don't, I think most mm. entrepreneurs are very optimistic in that way. They, they don't feel like they failed. It's like, okay, that doesn't work. Maybe even the capital has ran out, so I can't continue running this company. But they will keep going. I think, yeah. I think that's, that's what an entrepreneur would need. That's a good mm -hmm. point. That's so good point. even when you fail, I mean, would you say you need to have credible failures? Is that what you're saying? So you need to show or demonstrate to your next investors that, you know, you've learned... Uh, from your mistakes, you won't do it again. I, I think that's correct. It doesn't even have to be two different companies. I mean, in your every every day, the entrepreneur yes. is testing, yeah. and sometimes yes. the idea fails. Doesn't mean the entrepreneur failed, and it just means that you've learned that the idea that you had wasn't executed um, in the right way, and mm -hmm. you learned from it. And you so so being an entrepreneur is actually all about failure mm -hmm. because yeah. we we have them every day uh, in terms of the idea failing and, and learning from it and moving. And you get numb. <laughs> but yeah. do you think that the rest of Asia um, has embraced this notion of failure? Because I think in, in the Valley, they say a lot that you've got to fail often so that you can succeed faster. Jeffrey? I think in the general sense, um, it's a tough pill to swallow. It's, it's just you know, a, a sweeping statement across Asia. I think countries like Japan and Korea is extremely you know, um, risk averse. However, if... They have been a student of entrepreneurship. Um, they are attempting to do high-growth startups. The default state of that company is failure. So mm. if they get that in their head, then they, they wouldn't feel that bad. When like your success, so success in I the think, making, that's why I call it. <laughs> so I think this would help. Um, we spend at uh, 
at Bill Pin, which is uh, what we've been working on previously, we spent about six to 12 months now um, working on a bill splitting app for roommates. Um, and I think that was experiments that kind of failed in the sense that it wasn't growing fast enough. It's not bad, but it's not growing fast enough. And now we're going back to learning what we learned there and putting them into homey.co, mm -hmm. which is a new iteration of what it is. And I think hopefully more people will come out and say, that, say this and say that this is all right so that other people will feel like it's all right to say that that was wrong and now we're doing this. Okay, now according to the Harvard Business School, three out of four venture-backed startups don't return investors' capital, although VCs, I think, typically say that, you know, three or four out of ten, um, ten a crash. What do you make of the discrepancy here? Uh, I, my personal experience is that uh, two or three out of ten um, survive after uh, three, four years, and of those, uh, probably one or two uh, return money back to, to the investors. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's the name of the game. It's, it's all about risk-taking. Okay. Now, I, I guess when we talk about failure, yeah. everybody talks about Jonathan Abrams and Friendster, right, which turned mm -hmm. away $30 million from Google. That's the fodder of lots of MBA courses on strategy, etc. So what was the moral of the story from there? Was it, a, was it an ego story? Was it a power story? Was it, I mean, how did he misstep there? It might not necessarily be a misstep. I, I, my personal opinion might not necessarily be a misstep. And the same offer has been made to Zuckerberg many times. He didn't take it. And Facebook took off and keep taking off. Right? You, one could ask, maybe he should have taken that offer. Right? So it's not necessarily a misstep. Yeah, but he didn't count on the sort of competition that was going to catch up with him, right? Well, I'm, actually, I'm very familiar with the Friendster story because I led an investment into them. But, <laughs> but uh, the, the, uh, the Friendster story was... Uh, like many other stories where the, the first mover yeah. uh, had to scale so fast, yeah. they didn't put the infrastructure in place um, in an adequate fashion. And the f fast follower basically learned from that mistake and yeah. put the infrastructure in very well. And that happened uh, with Google and, and Overture, frankly. You know, um, yeah. Overture was the first mover. Google learned from their mistakes and built a much better infrastructure and therefore they were able to scale faster. Mm -hmm. So I think um, the Friendster story is, is all about the first mover and, and being able to sort of keep up with a pace of scaling. Mm -hmm. And so the lesson there is sometimes as entrepreneurs we like to put things together with bubble gum and glue. Uh, that will only last for a small period of time and especially if you have to scale you need a much stronger infrastructure to be able to hold this right. panel to scale. It's right. almost as though they're a victim of their own success. Exactly. Right. <laughs> right, so the competition basically snuck up on them. But, I mean, being an entrepreneur yeah. also means really knowing when to walk away. So when do you know when's the time to, to walk away? I mean, Friendster, that's all in hindsight now, and in hindsight, it's always 2020. So, so what do you do? Well, I mean, from Bill Pin, which is the last product of this iteration of this same company, um, we kind of went to the new product, um, because we ran off ideas of how do we make it grow faster. Um, that's essentially what it is. And, and then when, when we took a deeper look about what was causing the problem, which is basically disputes between roommates, um, what was causing the problem. And then we, dis we, we thought that actually we want to solve the problem at the root and from another angle. So I, we found a better angle to do it and we tried that. Mm -hmm. Kylie, you, you've sold two startups, so tell us why. No, specifically for the first one, the Groupon one is an outlier, you know, because once in a while you get a company that's growing super fast into billion dollar and, they're, and they're, 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 their mode of growth is by buying up local companies. So I had a choice. Either I fight with Groupon or I join Groupon, right? So I decided to join Groupon and, and I think that's been a really good experience. For sys.com, um, the decision, although it's different, but the core of it's the same. The, why I decided to sell those companies is because I wanted it to grow faster. So with sales.com, we were joining like a merged entity to build like a digital media group across Southeast Asia. And I say, you know what? That sounds like an eventuality. I want to be part of that. I want to help drive that. So we decided to join into that group. Okay. So that's the decision. So, so different strikes for different folks. But is there a perfect time to, to walk away? Should you be walking away when you're, you feel like you're on the verge of sort of tanking and you're sort of you know, still in the red? Or you, should you walk away when the music's still playing and you're turning a profit? There's a lot of times where you know um, entrepreneurs should have sticked around more. They should have not give up s too soon. Um, I think the case in point would be Pinterest. They they had 18 months of nothingness until something happened. I think the signs that tells you that it could be, you know, the users actually are not happy with what you have. Um, you know, they are not coming back. They're not retaining. Um, or sometimes it things just change. You know, from consumer facing, you have moved to 
you know, business facing. Over time, you lose motivation. You lose, you just lose that, mm-hmm. you know, that fire in you. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it all depends. That's why startups are just a very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> They're very interesting animals indeed. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, generally yeah. speaking, would you say a twenty, thirty million dollar exit is easier to reach than a two hundred million dollar exit? I mean, that's going to take much, you know, uh, much more time and much more money to feel. If you want to exit. The best way to reach there is not to think about an exit. Yeah, In other yeah. words, an exit is really mm-hmm. something that happens while you're working on your dream. Yeah. And at, at that point, if an offer comes in, first of all, it's a validation yep. of what you're doing. And number two, you kind of assess the fit, as you were saying, yep. the strategic fit. Will mm-hmm. it help you scale? Will it yes. help you grow? And, and the, the second thing you want to evaluate is, are they offering you a price um, which truly values your company as well as its growth in the future? And oftentimes, it's, it's an exit doesn't necessarily mean you're walking away because yeah. they will actually yeah. try to retain you to yeah. run that business and grow that business further. For me personally, the question would be every morning when I wake up, do I, am I spending my time doing the kind of things I would like to do today at work? If you find that too many days in a row, that's, <laughs> the answer is no. I, you, that might be a time whereby, okay, maybe somebody else is better, is better at doing what you are doing yeah. than you are. So okay. that's kind of where, where I thought about, think yeah. about walking away. Speaking about um, working on dreams and, and waking up every day and thinking, you know, you want to carry on, do you think that the region as a whole, Asia as a whole, has what it takes to build some sort of Silicon Valley of the East? I, I don't think I want it to be a Silicon Valley of the East. I think we're capable of something unique and something really special. And all of the companies that succeed over here, like uh, it, it, you, like this one company I used, I, I, I worked for them as my first job. They managed to hire 100 people from over 40 different countries to work out of Malaysia. How did they do that? They did it by being unique, by not trying to be somebody else. And you see Singapore trying a lot of unique things. You see each of these countries playing to their strengths and, and embracing their uniqueness. We could be something that's even cooler than Silicon Valley. That's mm-hmm. what I believe. Do you, think, do you think that the smaller countries here in Southeast Asia, are they really in the running? Because we know the, the, the bigger countries here, China, Japan, Korea, I mean, they're spheres unto themselves. I think there's a unique opportunity for the smaller companies to look at regional ideas and being able to address, sort of scale that population together and address a need. So bill payment, a great example. Many countries in the region don't have an e-payment channel, and there are many mobile sort of app companies who focused on mobile e-payment. And that solution probably is not needed in the U.S., Whereas in these markets, you can aggregate that need and build something for those markets. Mm-hmm. So what is the best advice um, you've gotten from your, from your mentors, mm-hmm. Jeffrey, and which you'd like to pass on uh, to, to an aspiring sort of uh, startup? The first thing is uh, if you have the burning desire to see something exist in the world, just go ahead and build it. And don't, don't worry about what naysayers are saying. Don't worry about anything. If, if you really have that burning desire, just do it. Chances are... It, will fail, but you will enjoy that process. All right, Darius, I mean, you're on to your mm-hmm. second or third venture now after that big sale to McAfee. So, I mean, looking back, would you have done anything differently? With hindsight knowledge, obviously, I would have done a lot of things differently. The one takeaway is, I would say, uh, stick to your guns and um, don't worry too much about what other people think. And I say that in the context of uh, the culture that we, that we live in today here in this region. Mm-hmm. Reza, I mean, you've been uh, in a corporate setup and you're now an entrepreneur and looking back, I mean, what sort of advice would you give to, to people thinking of quitting their day jobs? Well, I think an, on, being an entrepreneur is a, is a lonely endeavor. So find like-minded people, find mentors, uh, build, build a strong team that believes in the vision so that uh, it's not as lonely <laughs> and um, learn from other people's uh, lessons and mistakes. All right, Kylie, last word to you. Okay. Something that my first boss said to me when I was exploring uh, leadership and entrepreneurship stuff, he said that um, whatever you learn, whatever you see works elsewhere, as long as you're authentic, you know, you've got a higher chance of that kind of working. And if you're inauthentic by executing any of kind of advice, like it's probably going to fail. So that was like kind of like a curveball. I was like, wow, authenticity. How, how often do we talk about that? So right now in the, in the thirst for success and the thirst to grow and the thirst to expand, I think people should always stick true to the ethics and be really honest with the investors, with employees, you know, and with anything. And this kind of authenticity is something that I think is going to build a lot of trust. 
And there you have it, words of wisdom from my panel of startup gurus, Jeffrey Payne, Rosa Benham, Kylie Ung, and Darius Chung. Thanks very much for coming in. Now, it's clear Asian entrepreneurs are back in the race for the next big thing, the killer app that's going to wow the world and hopefully win the respect of their Western counterparts. But will the next Zuckerberg come from our neck of the woods? You'll never know. We've got a 4.3 billion strong population in the region and all it takes is one bright spark. If you have any comments on today's show or thoughts about the budding startups in Asia, share them with us on our website. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Leanne Pick. Until the next edition of Perspectives, thanks for watching.